seek to yield to the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for such time as he might consume. And I might ask the speaker what uh, the time remaining is at this point. Eleven minutes. The gentleman has about 13 minutes remaining. About 13 minutes remaining, so I'm hoping I can yield to the gentleman uh, eight minutes or something along those lines. <laughs> I thank the gentleman from Arizona for leading on this special order and all my colleagues that have come to the floor uh, to raise the issue on the balanced budget amendment. And uh, I, um, I wanted to just uh, point a few things out as... Um, to where this sets. Now, the chairman of the Constitution Committee standing before me, Mr. Franks, has uh, presided over the, uh, uh, the shaping of a constitutional amendment requiring a balanced budget, and I certainly favor the one that was authored by Bob Goodlatte and marked up in our full Judiciary Committee. It took three full days, and those days spanned over a couple weeks' period of time, trying to find the time to get this to work out. And I want to express, uh, Mr. Speaker, that a balanced budget amendment that's written by someone who doesn't believe in a balanced budget amendment probably isn't going to yield the result that we all want from that amendment. And, uh, you know, the worst case scenario would be some be the drafting and the passage of a balanced budget amendment that would be the constitutional equivalent of PAYGO. I mean, you could draft a balanced budget amendment that would say thou shalt balance the budget and not put provisions in there such as a cap on GDP or a supermajority required to raise taxes or a supermajority required to raise the debt limit um, or, of course, the cap, as I said. And if it were just the barest of bones, the bare minimum of the definition of a balanced budget amendment, then that could be a balanced budget amendment that would allow a majority vote of the House of Representatives and a majority vote of the Senate to waive the balanced budget amendment. That would be the amendment equivalent of pay-go, pay-as-you-go, waive it, or um, raise taxes in order to calculate that you balanced it. So I would caution that we need to do a prudent job of promoting a balanced budget amendment and continually defining that balanced budget amendment to be something that gives us fiscal responsibility. And I'll go more deeply into this perhaps um, in, a, in a half hour or so, but I wanted to also add that this legislation that has passed through the House of Representatives today, and I'm as joyous and delighted that Gabby Giffords was able to cast a vote on this bill today as perhaps almost anybody in this place, uh, save the folks that are closer friends in relation to hers, but what a day. What a day for this Congress to feel that emotion of her coming in this room and putting that vote up on the board and to hear that cheer go up when that light turned green. Um, we're on opposite sides of the issue, but uh, as I said, it is, it, is a, it is a deep feeling of, of uh, just great pleasure and gratitude and thanks that uh, she can walk into this place and do that or come into this place and do that. So, But here's a point I wanted to make, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, and that is that if we do nothing, if we, if we had not addressed this debt ceiling and dialed this spending curve down, in 10 years from now, this is what the lack of a balanced budget amendment will do. In 10 years from now, we would be, our, our national debt, our debt that we address today that's about $14.3 trillion, would be $28 trillion in 10 years if we just go along business as usual and the, uh, and the projections of the, the March baseline are projected out for a decade, as we do. $28 trillion in debt. If we accept the, I'll call it the Boehner proposal that passed the House here today because the numbers in it actually reflect the first Boehner bill of last Friday, then this bill that passed the House today our national debt still, if this bill effectively turns this spending increase down and the way it's supposed to in the deficit down, we're going to be looking at $26 trillion in, in our debt anyway in 10 years by 2021. $26 trillion. So we've gone from, when we got up this morning, projections of $28 trillion in debt in 2021 and 10 years from now, dialed it down to $26 trillion. If we just held the line on the Ryan budget, we'd have dialed it down to $23 trillion. And I'm not satisfied with that. When I see a budget that came out that balances in 26 years, now we've backed up some on that. I think we need to be stronger, not weaker. I think we need to step up and advocate and take these next few months and do all we can to sell America on the idea, selling the people that don't believe we should ever live under a balanced budget, that we must do so. 
And as I sat for those three days in the Judiciary Committee while we debated and marked up this balanced budget amendment that does these things that I've said, a three-fifths uh, supermajority to waive the balance or a three-fifths to raise the debt ceiling or two-thirds to exceed the 18% GDP cap or two-thirds to increase taxes, all of those things. And it requires the President also to offer a balanced budget and it allows the balanced budget requirement to be waived if we declare war or in a national emergency that's significant. Those things, if we don't do those things, then we end up in perpetual debt. And the, the people on the other side of the aisle that debated against a balanced budget amendment completely convinced me that they never want to live under a balanced budget unless it's the confiscation of all the wealth in this land and put it back through the money machine here in Washington. It would suppress the economy. It would starve and eventually kill the goose that lays the golden egg. $28 trillion is the projected. This, that's, that's the projected national debt in 10 years. The bill that passed today takes it down to $26 trillion. Ryan took it to 23 but we've lost a little bit of that leverage here today. But the people on the other side, and the President has convinced me also, he never wants to live under a balanced budget and certainly doesn't want to have a Constitution that would order that that be so. And so what do the American people have to say about people who are committed to deficit spending in perpetuity? What do they think happens? Where do they think America goes if we take our hands off of the rollback on the reins and the spending goes on and we borrow the money to fill all the wants of the American people for now? And what happens to our children and grandchildren when they have to service that debt or when the roof caves in when no one will loan us money anymore and we become mega Greece? This has been an intense debate here all around this country. It came to a certain head today. It's a long ways from over. This is a start. It's not the end. It's just a start. I thank the gentleman from Arizona, and I yield back.